Well, hello and welcome back to the Journey Home program. I'm your host tonight here on this program, and we have this great privilege once again here on EWTN to hear a story, a story of conversion, a story of how the Lord continues to, to lead one of His sons deeper and deeper to the faith, and we're, we're grateful to be here tonight to, to hear that story. We're joined by Father Randy Sly, who is a former uh, charismatic Episcopal bishop and now a priest of the personal ordinariate of the chair of St. Peter. Father, finally got you on the show. Yes, John Mark, it's so good to be with you. You too, Father. I, we, we've been in contact with for many years, and yeah. the last time we connected, it was down in Houston. It was um, at the installation of our new bishop. That's right, yeah. Bishop Lopes. Yeah. yeah. But we've been meaning to have you on the show for a long time, and so it's great for it to finally happen. Oh, I'm great. Glad to be here. Yeah. Well, let me step out of the way. Go way back to the beginning. Where did your story start? Oh, my goodness. Uh, well, I probably need to go way back to mm. the growing up in the Episcopal Church. Right. And uh, in growing up in the Episcopal Church, I was really active in the church. I was an altar server. Uh, in fact, I received the equivalent of the Congressional Medal of Honor for Altar Servers, because <laughs> on, at midnight mass on Christmas Eve, I was a torchbearer and I was going up the steps to the altar and I kicked the bottom of the torch and all of the wax came oh, down on my face and I kept walking oh, forward. Man. So, uh, anyway, so <laughs> anyway, I loved being in the church and that was kind of the, the start, I think, of a calling that would come to fruition many years sure. later. But then, like many kids, when I was in high school, I began to kind of diminish my interest in, uh, in the faith. I got involved in playing in a rock band uh, in high school, playing dances and everything, and ended up uh, as a radio disc jockey. Wow. <laughs> Starting, uh, I, I started just as I was ending high school. I had already been working for a radio station. And kind of as I got into being a rock disc jockey, that world kind of pulled me in and, and my faith and a lot of other things kind of diminished. And so that was the world I lived in. I was going to college and I was working yeah. as a rock jock and all of that. And uh, uh, I, I learned an interesting lesson and that is that if you don't do your work and if you don't go to class, you don't get good grades. <laughs> and this was back in the late 60s. And mm -hmm. so it was the Vietnam War was going on. I ended up getting eligible for the draft, and I thought, well, I'm going to join the Navy so that I don't get drafted, so I, uh, and I won't, won't go to Vietnam. So I joined the Navy. The Navy sent me to Vietnam uh, <laughs> on board a destroyer. And it was there that I think the first step on my journey happened, and that was I learned I was mortal. Hmm. You know, I was like 20 years old. Right. Uh, all of a sudden, I walked into the receiving terminal in Da Nang, Vietnam, and there were guys my age, they were on the floor there, they were bleeding, they were missing parts of their body, and I thought, I might not get out of here. Yeah. So my time in the Navy was really a time of growing up, it was a time of really being uh, more aware of myself, my mortality, and everything else. And also, it kind of straightened out the uh, kind of distorted priorities that I had as a rock disc jockey, where I was really into ego and all kinds of things having to do with just my own popularity. And it was out of that that during my last part of Vietnam, uh, I was then stationed in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. And one day I was walking down the beach. This was uh, after being stationed there for about a year and about ready to come out of the Navy. And I came across this, this uh band on a beach down in Waikiki, and they were playing music. And so I thought, well, this is cool. So I sat down to listen to them. And they were playing great music, but it wasn't about losing your girlfriend or the hot rod that you were dri uh, driving or anything like that. It was about the Lord. And I thought, this is really interesting. So I, I sat down and listened to them for a long time. A guy got up and, and spoke. And then afterward, a couple of the members of the group came and sat down with me by the palm tree where I was kind of sitting there in the sand. And they began to talk to me about why they were there. And they were from a church in Los Angeles, California, wanting to share about Jesus. And I said, well, I grew up in the church. Yeah. You know, I was an altar server and I did this. I was in the youth group. And they said, yeah, well, we wanted to tell you about Jesus and how he died on the cross. And they were going, I said, yeah, I remember uh, uh, midnight mass on Christmas Eve. This was going on. <laughs> And I loved talking with them. And it took me about a day because I came back and talked to them more. Yeah. And at that point, um, I, I realized something that I was talking about the building and they were talking about the occupant. Right. 
So I was walking down the beach going to meet with them uh, later on that second day, I think it was. And I just said, you know, I prayed for the first time probably in years other than, Lord, get me out of Vietnam without dying. Yeah. Uh, and I, I said, Lord, I don't know what this is all about, but I want to give you my life. And wham, I, I had one of those uh, uh, St. Paul and the Damascus Road experiences. I, I know it doesn't happen to everybody, but it did, did happen to me. I was literally changed from the inside out. My whole everything, I mean, all I could do was love the Lord and serve Him. Mm -hmm. I went out and I bought a Bible and uh, started reading the Bible. And so I came back from Vietnam a completely changed individual. Yeah. Uh, I went back to work at the radio station, but I realized that that was no longer going to be the call in my life. I went back to college and actually did well, you know, <laughs> graduated on the dean's list and uh, graduated with a degree in philosophy and religion wow. from Spring Arbor University up in Michigan. And I was at that time still working as a rock and roll DJ, and uh, I was doing a program uh, a documentary called Profile Battle Creek. It was basically, we had Kalamazoo, Battle Creek, Lansing, that area of central Michigan. And I was interviewing this guy and this girl uh, who were president and vice president of their youth group. And they were doing missions in downtown Battle Creek, witnessing to the motorcycle gangs. They were doing all kinds of things, handing out this thing they called the truth paper mm. and just doing evangelization. So I interviewed them on that program. We had a blast. And then the girl called me that night. She said, would you be interested in coming and visiting our church? Now, I had gone back to the Episcopal Church, but this was at a time of real upheaval in the Episcopal Church. It was the time of Bishop Pike and everything. And there wasn't a whole lot of, uh, there was a lot of confusion and not a lot of strong uh, ministry in what I was experiencing now in my life. Right. So I went to this uh, Wesleyan Methodist Church, uh, and I fell in love with the fact that they loved the Lord the way I love the Lord. And so I got involved in that church. And uh, in fact, uh, the girl that I interviewed became my wife. Wow. So uh, it was kind of an interesting thing how that all developed. And we'll be married 50 years this, this coming wonderful. November. Congratulations. So I was on a journey, and I became a part of the Wesley Methodist Church, became uh, involved in, uh, I guess, well, it was the pastor called it his group of preacher boys. Yeah. And so I was going to go to, uh, to uh, on in ministry and was going to be ordained to become a Wesleyan Methodist pastor. Went to seminary, went to Asbury Theological Seminary right. in Wilmore, Kentucky, and uh, graduated from there. It was an amazing experience. Uh, there at the seminary, uh, graduated with my Master of Divinity degree, and uh, I thought that I would actually go into a ministry of radio and TV, because mm -hmm. that was my background. But the Lord had other plans, and I ended up uh, pastoring a church, although media, communications, radio, television has always been a part of the background of what I did, yeah. but uh, became a pastor in the Wesleyan Methodist Church and uh, was there for a number of years, ending up in Manhattan, Kansas, because as a Protestant, I mean, you can go everywhere. I was in Michigan, then I was down in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, and ended up up in Manhattan, Kansas. And it was really during my time in Manhattan that something began to change in me again. Hmm. I would go to our church and Especially, uh, we were we were uh, very different. Most uh, Wesleyan Methodist churches had communion about once every six months. We had it every month, and I can remember vividly having our communion services. And all of a sudden, I began to miss my Episcopal upbringing, the beauty, the liturgy, the right. dignity with which communion was was uh, being offered. And I began to integrate just little pieces of that into what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And I thought, this is, this is crazy. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm cutting edge, evangelical, uh, you know, we're, 
we're kind of moving forward. Why am I longing to return to something historic? So I thought, you know, what I need to do is to destroy any bit of love that I should have for my historic upbringing in the Episcopal Church. So I began to read books that would basically diminish that. I read books on worship by uh, and moving into more of a charismatic realm or other types of things, praise and worship books. But there was still something haunting me, and I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pick an author that I love that I know wrote a book that had to do with liturgy, and I bet he's the one who's going to help me understand that I can just do away with it, C.S. Right. Lewis. Mm -hmm. He was an Anglican, but he was way ahead of his time, I thought. So I had this book called Letters to Malcolm, Chiefly on Prayer. I began reading the book, and I read the first chapter, and I realized I was really undone. Because in the first <laughs> chapter... It's going to be a common experience reading season. <laughs> yeah, <for> exactly. <laughs> I was really undone, because he starts out the book. Now, this is my paraphrase of it, but it's, yeah. My dear Malcolm, before we begin to talk about prayer, I need to tell you why I love the liturgy so much. And I went, oh, no. <laughs> but I kept reading. And he talked about the fact, he said, you know, the thing I love about liturgy is it keeps me focused on God that I am not surprised by what is happening, happening in the service. And I began to think about the kind of, of worship services that I put together for my people and how much surprise there was. And he began to talk about that. And then one of the things he said that just really killed me, he said, remember, my dear Malcolm, our Lord said, feed not my sheep, not experiment on my rats. And, and I thought about how much I had done that, that in the middle of a service, I would change what we're doing because I didn't see the people engaged. Hmm. And I thought, I've got to do something to pull them back in order for them to enter in. And what I realized, I was pulling them toward me, not toward the Lord. That's so interesting, right? It reminds me of, of examples in the Old Testament, right, where we... Do we really trust the Lord to work through his, the things He's commanded us, the promises He's made, the structures that He's set up? And there's always this, this urge that I need to take it into my own hands. And certainly there's, there's a part of it that we'll get more into the charismatic part. There's a part mm -hmm. of it where we, we do bring ourselves into it. But there's always this temptation to go too far and like, I need to make this happen. I need to, to bring about the fruit here. Yeah. Exactly. And I can't remember where I read about this, yeah. but it's... it's it, Fire needs to burn in a fireplace. Yes. It can't burn as on an open field because it's going to be a grass fire. It'll going to go everywhere. Right. But, and so I realized at that point that the liturgy provided that fireplace, those boundaries that will take me where I need to go and let the fire burn hot and white, mm -hmm. but to do it in a proper structure. Yeah. And so that took me on my journey uh, toward... Uh, coming back, I think, to my... Now, for me, historic was Anglicanism right. at that point. That was my reference point. As I, I looked at the Episcopal Church, I didn't feel like with what I had in my heart now as an evangelical, I, I wasn't in a place geographically where I was with a lot of uh, the Episcopal churches that were kind of moving that direction. And so I began to look for other, direct, uh, other ways to go, and I looked at the continuing churches that were out there. And I also looked at orthodoxy as a possibility and uh, talked, in fact, with a guy by the name of Peter Gilquist, who was in town. And we spent many hours together just talking about some things. In fact, he was one who really put the final nail in the coffin for me, so to speak, on what I was looking for and moving forward. Because we were talking about liturgy, and I said, you know, Father Peter, when I was growing up, I really felt like I was the victim of dead liturgy. Right. And he said, you've got to remember, liturgy cannot be dead or alive. It's either true or false. It's the people doing it that are dead or alive. And I realized, okay, I was the dead person. Mm. The liturgy was true. And so again, that was one of the things that kept propelling me forward. And I, can't, I, I was doing some writing at the time because... I had found some other people. I was living in Kansas City at the time. We moved from Manhattan, Kansas to Kansas City because I'd found a group of people that were kind of on the same journey. And we started writing about what we call the convergence of streams. 
And the convergence of streams was uh, a concept that was uh, basically uh, one where the evangelical, the charismatic, and the liturgical sacramental needed to be joined together to form the one mighty river of God. And that that's what God was doing is bringing these three rivers together. And so I was writing about convergence worship and um, had uh, worked with, now the name escapes me, Robert Weber from uh, Wheaton College was doing a, a set of commentaries. And he had me write on uh, convergence worship with this friend of mine who was on the journey with me, Wayne Basada. And so we began to publish these things. And I got a call from a guy in California, uh, Bishop, Bishop Randolph Adler. And he called me one day and he says, I've been reading what you're writing because it ended up coming out in one of the Charisma publications called Worship Today. And he said, um, I'd like you to fly to California because we've begun a new denomination called the Charismatic Episcopal Church. And we are integrating all three of the things that you're talking about in one place. So um, I went out to California and uh, met with them. And it, this was in the, the first stages. In fact, uh, they had just been written up in, uh, I think it was uh, Charisma Magazine. Uh, or Worship Today, I think was their other publication, there was an article by Paul Thigpen, who later converted, right. called uh, Ancient Altars, Pentecostal Fires. And the Charismatic Episcopal Church was highlighted as one of the denominations that was kind of moving this direction. So I had flown to California and uh, met with them and began and really felt like I was a part heart in heart with what they were doing. Right, many people. Yeah, it was, we were getting uh, phone calls even that weekend when I was visiting. They were getting phone calls and uh, letters. This was before the days of email. Uh, people that wanted to know more about what was going on. So I was kind of there in the office helping out and we really felt a bond. And uh, after some time and everything, uh, they asked if I would be willing to uh, submit myself for ordination in the Episco uh, Charismatic Episcopal Church. And uh, my wife and I prayed about it, and we said, yes, we would be glad to do this. At this point, I was pastoring an independent church in Kansas City who was on that same journey. So uh, little did they know, all of a sudden, they were going to become a part of something brand new. I was ordained a priest in the Charismatic Episcopal Church, and we became one of the early parishes helping to form this, this new uh, denomination that was Anglican in form, uh, but again, uh, with the evangelical and charismatic streams kind of flowing right. as a part of what we were doing. We were uh, using the Book of Common Prayer, the hymnals, and the things that were a part of Anglicanism at the time. Uh, later, I was or, uh, consecrated a bishop and I think by this time, uh, yeah, I was, I was still in uh, Kansas City area, had been uh, consecrated a bishop, and then later moved to the east to begin to develop the eastern seaboard, the middle Atlantic area, and uh, was named an archbishop with a denomination. Okay. So uh, I served them for 14 years. Um, we're talking tonight with Father Randy Sly, uh, former charismatic Episcopal bishop. I just wanted to the name out there again, for, especially for the radio audience listening. Um, Father, before we go any further, I mean, what do you have any, uh, what was your sense of the Catholic Church from your childhood and throughout all this? I mean, was there any sense that some of this stuff looked a little bit like that, or is that still foreign territory? Well, we looked a lot, of course, like the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. and I had a few friends that were Catholic, and I went to Mass with them, but mm -hmm. most of that was pre-Vatican II. Right. So my experience was, uh, more of the, the Latin Mass, the Tridentine sure. Mass. Uh, later on, though, of course, I, I saw myself as Catholic light right. because in the Charismatic Episcopal Church, we affirmed all seven sacraments, which is different from the, Charis uh, from the Episcopal Church USA and, uh, the, um, uh, you know, and, and their tenets. Uh, we, affirmed most, we, we affirmed transubstantiation, although we really use the term real presence mm -hmm. as our understanding of that. Uh, we used many of the prayers, uh, even the prayers from the Roman Missal, a lot of times for our, our Mass. Mm -hmm. 
I would say the, the big points that tripped us up would be uh, the Holy Mother, Marian theology okay. would be a biggie. Okay. And of course, we were not in communion with the Holy Father. Mm -hmm. I was a part, in fact, in the, the latter part of my time with the CEC with three other bishops, and, uh, or two other bishops, and the three of us were working with uh, a dialogue uh, with the, uh, the Catholic Church to get to know us better uh, because we envisioned something like what later became the ordinariate, although we saw it more as intercommunion rather than being uh, one of the parts of the Latin Rite. And so we were working with Cardinal Keeler in uh, Baltimore at the time mm -hmm. and his theologian, uh, canon theologian, and a few others, a canon lawyer, looking at who we are and, and everything. And so we had begun this dialogue. That brought me more deeply into uh, the Catholic world. Mm -hmm. So it moved from Catholic light to uh, seeing ourselves as having Catholicity, but not in full communion. And of course, still the, the Marian piece was a, right. was a big piece. What was the extent of, this, of the movement? Like how, how, how large was the CEC? The CEC back in the 90s when I was involved, and I, I left in 2006, uh, we were, uh, I don't know if it was official, but we were called by a number of publications, the fastest growing denomination in the world oh. at the time. We were international. We had churches in Europe, Africa, and Asia. And so uh, it was an opportunity for us. I did a lot of traveling internationally uh, for the church. Mm -hmm. uh, we were growing uh, very fast in the United States as well. And so uh, it was an exciting time. And we really saw ourselves as uh, really being uh, used by God in a, an amazing way, particularly to introduce to evangelicals and charismatics, the liturgical way. Right. And most of the movement, although we had some from uh, liturgical denominations that became a part, we had mostly evangelicals, charismatics that came in that uh, really embraced the fullness of what we were talking about. I was, gonna, I was gonna ask about what was the reaction of other you know, evangelical groups at the time, other Protestant groups at the time to that? They were scratching their heads, yeah. uh, wondering why in the world would you want to confine yourselves uh, to a liturgy? Why would you use that? Why would you want? And again, it was an opportunity to talk about fire in the fireplace right. uh, and, and those types of things. Plus, it, it was an opportunity to introduce um, evangelicals and charismatics who were a part of modernity at that point where history really didn't play a part in, in many of their understandings of things. Uh, for, for many people that I talked to, I mean, 1500 and the Reformation was kind of as far back as they went. But you begin talking about the church fathers, you begin talking about the early church, the, the liturgy, the Eucharist, and all of the ways in which that played a part historically in the church. And they went, wow, this is exciting, right. and came on the journey. Yeah, and you, you mentioned too that you'd experienced sort of pre-Vatican II Catholicism, which, I mean, that, obviously there's a whole can of worms on those topics to get into, but, but certainly the Holy Spirit in the church, in the Catholic church, was trying to bring renewal as well. Mm -hmm. that, that there was, you know, not that it was, there was something bad, but that we, there needed to be this renewal in, mm -hmm. in liturgy and worship as well. And so it's interesting to see that happening, uh, you know, from, from the perspective in the church, seeing that happen in other groups as well at that time. Yeah. yeah. And I, there were uh, two particular people that I think represented the church to me so well that were really contributing to my journey. Yeah. The first was when I was in seminary. I was doing my chaplaincy rotation at a hospital, and the, uh, the head chaplain there was a, a Roman Catholic priest. And he taught us the ministry of presence, which mm. was a marvelous gift to young, fervent evangelicals who wanted to go in and convert everybody. And he began to talk to us about just going into the room to be the presence of Jesus, which was a, a wonderful way for us to learn something about the sacramental life. Right. And so he kind of planted some seeds. And then uh, I had, part, as I said, when I became an archbishop, I had moved to um, Virginia out near Washington, D.C. And I became a part of a group of, uh, of Christian leaders who presented the Ten Commandments to members of Congress and things like that. 
And I became friends with a Roman Catholic deacon by the name of Deacon Keith Fournier, uh, who is still a deep and dear friend of mine today. And Deacon Keith was a wonderful representative of the Catholic faith without condemning me for who I was and where I was, mm -hmm. but continually represented the church. And so we had amazing talks. And uh, I would say that that, along with reading the church fathers and also uh, some other great Catholic works, Dom, uh, uh, you know, uh, The Lord uh, by uh, Romano Gordini. Uh, I'm trying to think of uh, some Balthazar, von Balthazar. Uh, of course, you got to read Scott Hahn, <laughs> you know, uh, and, and uh, just individuals like that. There were so many conversion stories that really contributed to a hunger that began to burn in me for it. It actually, it started the embers were probably 10 years prior yeah. to my coming into the church. Well, let's take a little break there uh, and we can dig more into that and what, what eventually opened you up further to the rest of that journey. We're talking tonight to Father Randy Sly, a former charismatic Episcopal bishop and now a priest of the personal ordinariate of the chair of St. Peter. Again, we're going to come back to hear the rest of his story, but if any of it's resonating with you, uh, again, especially the last points you made, Father, the importance of hearing other people's stories about encountering people who have been through some of the same things we have been through, um, send us an email. We'd love to hear about your story. We'd love to answer any questions you have. We'd love to walk with you on your journey. Uh, check out chnetwork.org for that. So we'll be back in a couple minutes to hear the rest of Father Randy's uh, slices story. Welcome back to the Journey Home program. We've been joined tonight by Father Randy Sly, former charismatic Episcopal bishop and now priest of the personal ordinariate of the chair of St. Peter. And he's been telling us uh, his story uh, and just this fascinating bit of history of the CEC, the charismatic mm -hmm. Episcopal church, and this, this concept, you know, the, these, uh, these Christians, uh, believers who were pursuing these three streams, right? Uh, and how mm -hmm. that, that formed into this, this new movement. Um, but when we left off, you, you were discussing a little bit about how for 10 years or so, uh, the Lord had sort of been opening your heart to a hunger for something more. So why don't you pick, pick that back up. What, what happened then? Yeah, it, it was an interesting 10-year period. Mm -hmm. I was reading more and more Catholic uh, theology, mm -hmm. reading the Church Fathers. I fell in love with Irenaeus and Ignatius. Uh, 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 St. Peter Chrysologus became one of my friends. And I began using the Liturgy of the Hours because I love the office of readings. Yeah. And uh, so the, the journey was very gradual. And as I said, Deacon Keith kind of accompanied me. You know, we, we use that word a lot now in the Catholic world, right. accompaniment. And he accompanied me on my journey the whole time. And during that, never once uh, diminished what I was doing, but just properly represented who he was, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, which I loved. That was really a great thing for me. And Toward the, the I think at the, the culmination came in the early 2000s. Again, I was in um, Michigan. And at one point, uh, another bishop and I were invited by uh, then Archbishop Dolan of uh, Milwaukee, the Archdiocese of Milwaukee, to just visit and talk with him about what we were doing in dialoguing with the Catholic Church. And so we went and spent some days with Cardinal Dolan, now Cardinal Dolan. Mm -hmm. And it was wonderful. I mean, I, I just fell in love with the guy from the get-go. I just thought, this, this is, he's amazing. Mm -hmm. And as we talked more and more, a couple of things began to really come crystal clear that I had already seen, and that was, really, if you want to talk about the three rivers of evangelical, charismatic, and uh, liturgical sacramental, that's the Catholic Church. Right that what, what happened in the early days is those, that one mighty river sent out tributaries in these three areas, but they needed to come back. And again, I think sometimes those of us who came out of the evangelical or the charismatic, I, I identify probably more from the evangelical or the liturgical sacramental, but coming into the Catholic Church, we kind of bring some of that jargon, some of that orientation to enliven that part of the river of 
of right. God, you know. Which the church affirms so much. I mean, I, exactly. I, I can't quote it, but there's that, that bit from the, the catechism, from the, I think it's from the you know, Lumen Gentium, about that the Holy Spirit does this. The Holy yeah. Spirit, even amidst our brokenness, the Holy Spirit works through Christian believers who are trying to draw close to the Lord to bring these charisms back mm-hmm. to renew the church. Uh, and so th- this is this is part of our faith that the Holy Spirit works like that. You know? Yeah, and and that's what we talked about. And the more we talked with Archbishop Dolan and everything, I, I'll never forget one night uh, we were staying at uh, the seminary next door, uh, and my room was across the hall from the uh, mezzanine to the chapel, yeah. and I was awake in the middle of the night. I couldn't go to sleep, and I went over and just knelt at the you know in the mezzanine looking over into the chapel area looking down at the blessed sacrament and just praying and i went back to my room that night and i was just lying there and i went lord i'm called to be catholic but i didn't know what to do with that yeah here you know i i was an archbishop in a denomination that was growing that was things were going well uh and I had people who were depending on me, right. other bishops, uh, priests, people of my own local parish. And at that point, I had to say, I have to lay it down because I need to be their shepherd. Mm. And, uh, and so that's what I did. Now, interestingly, as all of this was going on in me, my wife was also going through her own journey mm. Uh, through reading Scott Hahn and through other things, and also just through the Holy Spirit kind of doing something in her to draw her more deeply into that particular direction. And one of the things that happened is our denomination went through kind of a hiccup, uh, and it, it, it came through some issues having to do with the administration of the church. It didn't have to do with morals or, or liturgy, it had to do with administration. And there was a bit of upheaval and several of the bishops left. And I remember when we were going through this upheaval, there were a couple of times where Sandy just looked at me, she said, why don't we just become Catholic? Mm-hmm. You know, it's kind of like, there, there's just so much going on here. But as these bishops began to, to leave and, and join others of the different continuing churches, uh, and by the way, the CEC is doing fine again. You know, it just was going through this upheaval mm-hmm. that we thought, well, we really felt called. Mm-hmm. And if there's ever a time we can leave without causing a huge stir, this would be a good time for us to quietly leave because um, there was going to be a number of reorganizational things taking place anyway. Right. So uh, as other bishops left to become bishops uh, in uh, other Anglican-like groups. Mm -hmm. Uh, My wife and I quietly left and were received into the Catholic Church at the time. And um, it was still a bit of a shock Mm -hmm. uh, to a number of people, but in my own local parish, I think we had (laughs) maybe done too good of a job of talking about Catholicity and things like that, half of my parish actually came into the Catholic Church. The other half went Orthodox because one of my uh, brother priests there, who was a dear friend of mine, had fallen in love with Antiochian Orthodoxy and uh, was leaving to go that direction, and some people felt a a calling to go that way. So we basically went two different directions at that point. So that was in 2006 that we came into the church Uh, And it was, as I said, it was a hard leave in a sense, but coming into the church, it was a challenge to come in. I was being mentored at the time by Monsignor William Stetson, who was the head of the Catholic, uh, uh, well, the group in um, Washington, D.C., the Catholic Information Center there in downtown Washington. And he met with me uh, because he was also one of the representatives of the uh, uh, pastoral provision. And uh, so we began talking, and he, I, I have to say he was ruthless in a good way. <laughs> I, I, I owe so much to Monsignor Stetson. And he said to me one time, he said, when you come into the church, you have to give up any 
expectation that you will ever be ordained again. But don't give up hope. And he said this, he said, if Holy Mother Church wants you to be a priest, she will make a way for you. Well, that's what I needed, was that sense. I mean, I, it was a yes every, I mean, it was a yes going from evangelicalism back to the charismatic Episcopal Church. Uh, my wife and I have been, one of the things we've always determined in our life, we'd always say yes to God. Mm. It was a yes coming into the charismatic Episcopal Church. It was a yes leaving the church and coming in to full communion with the Catholic Church. Why not say yes to Holy Mother Church about ordination? Mm -hmm. So we came in in 2006. Uh, at that time, of course, there was no ordinary yet. There was the pastoral provision, but the diocese in which I uh, entered uh, had no need for a pastoral provision priest and no real uh, methods for getting one in. I, I was a good friend of the bishop, and he welcomed me wonderfully. Uh, in fact, he ordained me later as a priest. Um, but there was no place for the pastoral provision. So we came in, and I basically just had to reinvent myself. And because I there was nothing in the want ads for out-of-work archbishops, yeah. you know. <laughs> uh, so I took my background in marketing, communications, media, and just formed a media company and uh, went to work networking, uh, did Christian media as well as other things. And, uh, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention that my whole family came into the church too. Oh, well, praise God. Yeah, yeah, so all of my kids, all of my grandkids, uh, we were all in the church together when we came in, which was a real gift yeah. at the time to really see that unified movement forward in the, in the parish. So uh, I reinvented myself and got, uh, and Monsignor Stetson said, just become fully involved as a Catholic. Mm -hmm. So I became a Knights, member of the Knights of Columbus. Mm -hmm. I think I held every single office in the Knights with the exception <laughs> of Grand Knight because I was being ordained mm -hmm. at that time. But I, I sold the, you know, I did the fundraising for uh, special needs with the Tootsie Rolls. You know, you name it, I did it. Yeah. I used to say one week I was, uh, carrying a crozier in procession. Two weeks later, I was pushing a broom at the pancake breakfast. Mm. And, you know, I coming into the church, I, I never felt that a, a lament. It was just a joy again to say yes. It was, and, not, and the nice thing is, I was bringing everything I was into who I was becoming. Right. And what I had to do was now to more incorporate, I had already worked through Marian issues before we had come into the yeah, church. I was ask about that. Yeah. yeah, that was something, that was probably the final pillar that had to topple, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I finally got that one, uh, and, and it came in an amazing way because I was very involved in the pro-life movement. I was a part of the National Pro-Life Religious Council with Father Frank Pavone, who again became a good friend. And so it was out of that pro-life thing, I thought, well, life starts at conception, if God wanted to purify Mary's soul, when would he do it? At the beginning of life. So my pro-life made me realize, well, of course, the Immaculate Conception. Hmm. Yeah, duh. <laughs> and uh, so that was a beautiful piece to fall into place. The, the assumption was already an issue that I never had any trouble with. Hmm. And, uh, you know, her queenship, the coronation. As a good Anglican, you understand the Queen Mother. So yeah. <clears throat> that was, those were good to go. So with that all in place, then coming into the church, we just settled in and began to fully be uh, who we were as Catholics. But I never let go of hope, and I waited for Holy Mother Church. Mm -hmm. And so that was 2006. Three years later, word came, uh, Pope uh, Benedict XVI was going to uh, authorize an apostolic constitution, Anglicanorum Chaitavis, yeah. for former Anglicans. And when he did that, I was so disappointed because I thought it would only be for those that were not yet in the church. Right. And so I thought, oh man, if I'd have just stayed out, if I'd have just stayed an Anglican, then. <laughs> but then I read the document, which was a good thing to do, <laughs> yeah. and realized it counted for me too. So, uh, the wonderful thing about living in the uh, Northern Virginia, Washington, D.C. area is that uh, Cardinal Worrell was put in charge of the ordinariate 
formation in America uh, with a priest on his staff, Father Scott Hurd. Mm -hmm. And so I made contact with them this, as soon as I heard about it. And I began the process then uh, when it was authorized, which was 2011, uh, we were allowed to begin to make application, which was an amazing process. First, you had to present a dossier to Rome, to the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. And so uh, that dossier was not for the faint of heart. Mine, I think, was about two, feet, uh, two inches thick. <laughs> um, transcripts, uh, yeah. a life narrative of everything you did in ministry. Uh, all kinds of uh, different uh, aspects of, of what you did, uh, re letters of recommendation. Uh, this was interesting, a letter of permission from my wife. Right. That she would uh, that she cooperated and was, was in good shape with this. Right, because those two voc vocations. The that, two vocations you know, they're, had they're to go together. Yeah. So that was submitted to Rome, and... I received uh, a response six months later, which in Rome is like an instant message. <laughs> and um, I received the nulla osta, which means there's no impediment. And it, all it means is there is that possibility should at some point, at some time, you be considered for the priesthood that there is nothing that would impede you from continuing toward that possible process. <laughs> so it wasn't very... It's uh, very you mean specific. There's a chance. There's a chance. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, but then there was a second round that you put into place, and that was uh, uh, psychiatric, psychiatric evaluations, not only for me, but for my wife. Uh, there was psychological inventories, background checks, security checks, uh, and so more additions to the dossier. And um, this was again submitted to Rome. Now, while that all was going on, I was going through formation as, as a Catholic priest uh, through uh, St. Mary's Seminary in Houston by video with the rest of the ordinariate hmm. candidates, uh, the first class. Yeah. So that was all going on. And then in April of 2012, we finally got the word, uh, the, the rescript had been granted and I could be ordained. Wow. So that was that was pretty exciting. So it had been about a year in process, which again for yeah. Rome, that's a pretty fast thing. Right. Yeah, the, the whole process is something that's probably foreign to most listeners and most watchers, whether Catholic or non-Catholic. Um, but it, it's it's an important it's important the church takes it so seriously, uh, and even from from within the church when we look at it, um, just recognizing you know how significant your own vocation was before you became Catholic. You know, and the church has tried to had to try to wrestle with that. Right. Right. Like, well, this is not the state that the church is supposed to be in, a divided Christendom. But we have this situation where, I mean, again, you you and other Christians were coming together and following the Lord. And right. you, you had a real call, mm -hmm. you know, and then the church has had to discern, well, how do we how do we deal with these people who have been called to this ministry? How do we how do we discern through that with them? So it's an important process. Yeah, it is. And in fact, one of the things that I did when I came into the church is I submitted myself again to the Lord, am I called? Amen, yeah. That I, I didn't want to presume that just because I was, that I, I should be. Right. And I offered it all up to the Lord. And so that's where, again, Monsignor Stetson's, if Holy Mother Church wants you to be a priest, she'll make a way, that they needed to discern too that I was called, which was a part of that process. Um, and, and so it was, it was a powerful thing. And for me, the culmination was to realize that my rescript and, it came from the Holy Father himself. Mm -hmm. In other words, it wasn't a bishop saying, yeah, we're going to do this. It was the Holy Father saying, yes, Randolph Sly should be a priest, and then gave me a dispensation from celibacy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was, those were the two things that you needed. And so it was just a few weeks later, I was ordained a deacon yeah. uh, at the Basilica of the Shrine, the National Shrine uh, in Washington, D.C. And then three weeks later, I was ordained a priest on June 23rd in 2012 by Bishop Laverty, my mm -hmm. own diocesan bishop. And he did it in my local parish uh -huh. so that all of the people that had been walking this journey with me for yeah. five and a half years could be there with me. Mm -hmm. uh, it was great because we had an honor guard of my brother knights because I was a fourth degree knight 
And it was just the most amazing day. The, uh, talk a little bit about the ordinariate, um, you know, for those who, again, who aren't familiar with it, what it is and what it, but, but I think more importantly, what it represents in terms of the church affirming the, the patrimony that was brought in in terms of some of the liturgical side, but also uh, for you more personally, the, the, the charismatic, uh, charismatic and evangelical gifts. Yeah, it's interesting that uh, before the ordinariate, there was the pastoral provision that Pope Bennett, uh, Pope St. John Paul II in pl- put in place in about 1980, and a right. few priests came in with that. But that was basically being incarnated into an existing diocese. Mm-hmm. The ordinariate through the apostolic constitution was uh, organized governmentally as the best I can describe it as a non-geographic diocese. For us, it was made up of uh, North America, Canada, and the United States, much like the archdiocese of the military, Mm -hmm. except those priests have a second incarnation with their local diocese. We are actually incarnated into the ordinariate. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we have our own bishop. uh, But with Anglicanorum Chaitibus was more about bringing parishes, not just individuals who want to be priests, because you had to actually have a community that you would lead in order to be ordained. You couldn't just be ordained as a freelancer. Yeah, yeah. So I had a, a community in Northern Virginia that I was uh, leading, and uh, so that was my gateway into uh, the priesthood uh, with the ordinariate. We're non geographic, we're national. Mm-hmm. So uh, after three years, I was asked to relocate to Kansas City to oversee the ordinary community there. And uh, also because the ordinary community was so small, I was placed on loan to the uh, Diocese of Kansas City, St. Joseph. And then later uh, I was given full time to the the diocese to be used in in a couple of roles. I know I'm kind of moving fast forward through these things, Um, but I was uh, assigned to a parish, a large parish of 3,500 families as an associate. And then later the bishop invited me to be the pastor of a local parish, Our Lady of Sorrows in downtown Kansas City for three years. And then I was also invited to be the president of a brand new high school, St. Michael, the Archangel Catholic High School in Lee Summit, Missouri. Yeah. And I did that for four years and then uh, also served as a uh, a consultant for the fifth year. I just concluded my consultant's year with them. So that basically is uh, kind of what I'm doing now as I'm yeah. uh, in full-time employed by the diocese. There's so many amazing things. I mean, God, the Lord has continued to use your gifts and your charisms. Again, it was, we, we have about seven minutes left, but I, I want to talk a bit more, again, circle back around to those charisms because that that is one of the real fascinating things about the story, right? Mm-hmm. Is that, you know, being involved in the CEC, um, and recognizing that in the life of the church, when it's at its healthiest, yeah. right, those things come together. Um, and talk a little bit about the about the liturgy, if you would. We have we are in a time nowadays where right, there's, there's a real thirst to return to that um, in in its fullness in, with those streams together. Uh, talk, uh, talk a little bit about the liturgy, if you would. Yeah. One of the things that I think was was key for me mm-hmm. is to understand the why behind the what. Yeah. I had grown up with a what. I mean, I knew the liturgy backwards and forwards. In fact, in doing uh, the divine worship missal mass of the ordinariate and doing the gestures and everything because we were able to bring our patrimony with us in the ordinariate so that uh, much of our uh, liturgy looks very much like the Anglican church. In fact, it comes from the old Sarum rite. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so in celebrating... I found myself doing gestures and everything, and I realized I'm Father Barker, <laughs> who was my priest growing up in the Episcopal Church. So I knew the what. I, I was there at the altar with him, and I would watch him up close and personal. And now I was doing that very same liturgy. The, the Eucharistic prayer is different because we use the Roman Missal, uh, the Roman Canon in uh, sacred English. But I just found that the what was the same, but I understood the why. And when you, all of a sudden, the liturgy takes on a charismatic dimension. That charismatic isn't just exercising the gifts. Charismatic is a perspective for living out your life. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't go to Mass 
and see bread and wine become body, blood, soul, and divinity without being charismatic. Mm. You know, transubstantiation is supernatural. Yeah. Uh, you can't listen to the words of consecration. You can't look at a priest as being in persona Christi yeah. without that. There's nothing uh, uh, about the liturgy of the Word that is not a beautiful expression of our evangelical stream. Mm -hmm. You've got readings from Scripture. We read, uh, we read more Scripture in the Mass than I read to my people when I was an evangelical pastor. Mm -hmm. I read one passage and then I exposited on it. Here we read, you know, we have an Old Testament psalm, New Testament, gospel, and then exposition. Yeah. Uh, you know, and so the the evangelical stream is also alive there. Yeah. The, I, I love the connection you make between the, again, the when liturgically, when we take seriously the Holy Eucharist, mm -hmm. that, that we really believe this is this is our Lord present to us there. We take this seriously, it goes hand in hand with the charismatic stream, right? Mm -hmm. because we have a uh, edition of the Coming Home Network newsletter coming out next month, I believe, and the theme of it is adoration, Eucharistic mm -hmm. adoration, and we have some good reflections in there from staff members talking about how you know that experience of really coming to to meet uh, Christ in in uh, adoration of the Holy Eucharist. Well, it, it can't help but but draw you into the Holy Spirit, like Lord, what what are you speaking to me? What is your will in my mm -hmm. life? Those two things come together, and they're supposed to come together. But I, I love the analogy again of the of the fireplace and the fire that we. We have this context the church preserves for us mm -hmm. within which we encounter Christ where the Holy Spirit can move us to true worship. Absolutely. And to, just to see the Holy Spirit work through the sacraments is so powerful yeah. when you expect and, you know, it, it's a part of, of who you are. Yeah. I remember going to a, uh, a hospital and there was a woman that was dying there. And so I uh, gave her the anointing of the sick and she was not even conscious. Uh, she had. She was a part of a retirement community where I was serving as a Catholic chaplain, uh, as and so uh, it was. I was there with the the chaplain of the community there, uh, and I anointed her with oil, prayed the prayers and everything, and I left. And uh, I was back at the retirement facility the following Friday, uh, and I was going to offer mass to this one little uh, Catholic community there, and. <laughs> I walk in, this lady in the wheelchair goes, hey, Father, how are you? And I said, well, fine, how are you? She said, you know, I don't think I remember you visiting me in the hospital last week, but I understand you came and prayed for me. <laughs> what do you do with that? Well, yeah. Y you know, and uh, so it's, it's wonderful. Now, does that happen every time? No. But it's wonderful to see the sacraments being used in a way, uh, you know, that where you see God at work yeah, in a yeah. power. And that work can be even if she wasn't healed, if her soul was properly inclined to meet Jesus. Right. How good is that? Yeah. And we have in the sacraments, uh, it's, it's not that we, again, we can't pray, as, as, as is often said, like, why can't I go to God? Why can't I go straight to God? We can, mm -hmm. and we do. Um, but we have this gift from God in the sacraments of this place where we, we have the certainty that we can otherwise have. Like when I right. encounter the sacraments, I know that in a particular way, because God has in, in, instituted the sacrament, that He is here in a special way. So I, I already know He's showed up. Right. The question exactly. is then, when do I show up? You exactly. Know, to expose yeah. myself to that. Yeah. I, I think that's and one of the things I constantly exhort uh, anybody that <laughs> this within earshot when I'm preaching is you know to be engaged with what we're doing. Uh, I was teaching the, well, I had all school mass for our school at the, at the parish. And I, I taught them this little phrase. I said, you know, when you're, if this was a play, I would be the actor and you would be my audience. I said, but this is worship and right. God is our audience and you're the actors. Wow. And, you know, yeah. and so I taught them the phrase, this is worship. And their response was, and God is our audience, you know, mm -hmm. and so we were doing that. But it's something for us to remember. We we come to mass not for ourselves, right. but for Him. Right. Yeah. 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 He's our audience, not yeah. each other. Exactly. <laughs> We're not there to be entertained. That's right. We are there to make of ourselves uh, true and holy worship. We, we are. We have about thirty seconds left. 
Uh, Father, I want to thank you for joining us and for oh, sharing your my story. Uh, it's just so wonderful to finally have you on some <laughs> oh, it's years. Good to be here. Uh, you've got a lot of projects going, as you mentioned. Where can people find out some, about your show and some of the projects you're okay, involved in? Okay, I, uh, I do a national podcast called Follow to Lead for the Duke and Alton Schools Collaborative, which you can find on iTunes, Spotify, okay. and all that. I have Day by Day, which is a daily video reflection that I do through St. Therese Community that's nationally distributed as well on YouTube. Awesome. Oh, well, thank you so much, Father. And thank you for joining us for this episode of the Journey Home Program. As always, I, we, we hope that this story has been inspiring to you. If you, if you yourself are, are on this journey, if you're interested in the church, uh, if you are someone uh, for whom these streams of, of the charismatic, the evangelical, the liturgical, if you have hunger for that, we want to talk to you about that. We want to hear about that. So send us an email. Check out chnetwork.org. We'd love to accompany you on your journey. Uh, once again, thank you for joining us for this episode of the Journey Home Program. God bless you. Talk to you again next week.